Good morning. Does that mean you can hear me? That's good. I'm actually, hang on one second. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? All right. Good morning. It is a gorgeous day. Chilly, yes, but beautiful. I want to welcome here Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology. How many of you have ever been here before? Anybody ever been here to this school? Awesome. How many of you know someone who has ever attended Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology? Very cool. How many of you think that Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology could possibly be your place for education after high school? Yeah? All right. I'm hoping after this more hands go up. That'd be pretty cool. So my name is Lauren Grove. I'm the Director of Career Services here at the college. So it's my job to help all of our students connect with those awesome jobs once they graduate and while they're here for internships. The reason I'm here this morning is to introduce you to a couple people. So they're gonna to talk to you a little bit about the college and, and why they're here. But before we do that, I wanna do a couple housekeeping details. Some of you have already found it, but in case you haven't, if you need to use the restrooms, if you walk out this door right in the lobby in the middle of the hallway there, you'll find the bathrooms. If you need to go, just go ahead out, come back in make quiet if possible, but that's where they are. Right now, what I'd like to do is also share with you that when you leave here, if you want some additional information about Thaddeus Stevens, please visit the table out here in the lobby. Our admissions staff and team are out there. They can answer any questions that you have, and you can feel free to pick up some information on the school as well. To get started, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Bill Griscom. He is the president of the college. Dr. Griscom. Thank you, Lori. So this is about STEM jobs. What's STEM? Anybody? Yeah. Science, technology, engineering, and math. That's right. That's what STEM jobs are. Every program that we have here, with one exception, is a STEM job. It requires science, uh, technology, math, and it is part of engineering. And these are great jobs in Pennsylvania right now and in, across the United States. There's a huge, what we call a skills gap. Has anybody ever heard of that? A skills gap. It means that all these companies are out here and they can't fill the jobs where they need people. They have equipment that should be running all day and they just can't find people that, that can operate that equipment. These are great jobs. Our, the, the students who graduate from this college, the, the median starting salary is $42,500. A lot of our graduates, when they graduate, they start at $50,000, $70,000 in four or five years. They're making over $100,000 a year. That's incredible. A lot of people just don't realize that, that you can do that with a two-year degree. And you can do more with a four-year degree in some of these STEM fields. Uh, Pennsylvania, I was um, in front of the Pennsylvania Senate uh, uh, last week, and the person who was in front of me was the president of Pennsylvania College of Technology, and they have four-year degrees in engineering technology, and they said their graduates, some of them started at $150,000 a year. This is stuff that used to be the only way you could get to those kind of jobs if you had a four-year degree or more. And, and it's a new economy today. Things are changing. There's just tremendous opportunities in these STEM fields. And last year, at this college right here, this group just spoke before me, she's uh, in charge of, of placing our students. We had 1,400 companies come here, and they had over 3,000 jobs for 400 graduates. Our students were picking between different opportunities. And the median student loan debt here, 35% of our students have no student loan debt, but of the 65% that do, the median student loan debt was $9,000. You can graduate from a school like ours or, or other schools, and you can pay that back in a short period of time, and you can buy a house and have a family sustaining wage. Let me move away from that for just a minute. Um, I've been here for a long time, I've been here for 22 years. As you can see, I'm one of the older people at this college. I've got children and grandchildren, and down the road I'm going to have great-grandchildren. I have a daughter and I have three granddaughters. And, you know, I love them all, and I want the best thing for them. And one of the things is I want them to be in a loving relationship and just have a really good life. 
The other thing that I want for them is I want them to be independent. I want them, regardless of what relationship that they're in, I want them to be able to be able to support themselves and their children and, and be able to give them the things in life that they want to give them. And we've had a number of students come here over the years that are single mothers or uh, come from difficult circumstances. They've come here and they've gotten an education in just two years, they've graduated, they've gone out and they've started 65 or $70,000 a year. And they're not dependent on anyone else for being able to take care of themselves and, and provide the things they need to provide for their families. So we, we, women don't normally come to technical programs because we have these ideas of what are uh, appropriate women's jobs and men's jobs, that's all changing. It used to be that if you worked in industry, you worked in this difficult, cold, dark, dank environment, and you had to be able to lift millions of tons of things and all this kind of stuff. That's not the way it is today. The people that graduate from our computer integrated manufacturing program, which is the machine technology program, they work in a sterile environment. They are using multi-axis milling machines, which we have on this college that are state of the art to create medical implants and things like that. That is a wonderful environment to work in. They have headphones on, they're playing their music, and they're making these things and they're making lots of money. About 11% of the students that come here are women, and honestly, when they graduate, they get their choice of jobs. They're the first because come, industry wants them. And they make really great salaries and they can take care of themselves, they can live the American dream, with or without somebody else, they can buy a home, they can take vacations and cars, and, and they can control their lives and take care of their children. There's also another aspect of this. The types of jobs that we have here, and other colleges have them as well, we're not the only uh, show in town, but there's something special about being able to do something where you see the results of it, where you actually physically make something and do you feel the pride and satisfaction of doing that? I've had a number of, I grew up on a farm out in the country um, with, with a, a limited amount of material things, and I've worked all of my life, and I've had different types of jobs, and pushing paper is one of them, and working behind a desk, that's one thing, but the most satisfying things I've ever done in my life are things where I actually can build something and see it, and think, you know, I did that, I, I, I made that. And that's the kind of jobs that we have here, hands-on jobs where you have the satisfaction of actually doing something, and we're doing that in a really great environment. Um, as I said, women who have graduated from this institution and others in technical fields really have their choice of, of, of what the jobs are out there. And I'll leave you with just one thought. There's one of our graduates um, who was our commencement speaker a couple of years ago, a young lady. Her name's Elizabeth Valentin. I'm gonna spell that for you, because I'd like you get a chance to Google this, it's called, it's V-A-L-T-E-N-T-I-N. Now, Valentine, there's no E on it, but if you Google Elizabeth Valentin, she has a TED Talk. How many people know what TED Talks are? You ever see a TED Talk? Okay, she has a TED Talk, and it's, it's called Inspire, Empower, and Ignite Girls in STEM. She's one of our graduates. She graduated with a double major from here. Um, she's the breadwinner in her family. Her husband is a stay-at-home dad and takes care of the kids. And she has she had her choice of any job when she graduated, whether it be mechanical engineering technology or whether it would be computer integrated manufacturing. And it's really inspirational and gives you some idea of what you can do with a STEM career. So again, I welcome you here. I hope that you take advantage of the opportunities that will be talked about today and listen to our speakers. At this point, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Grove. Thank you. All right, so I see there are young ladies and young men in this audience. That's fantastic. So while you're going to be hearing some, from, some from, excuse me, from some dynamic women who are in STEM fields, young men out there, take heed and realize that these careers are for everyone. Men, women, each of you represent half the population. We need all of you to consider these careers in order to fill the jobs that are out there. One quick example before I introduce our next speaker is 
Dr. Briscoe talked about some of these women who are graduating from Daddy Stevens and doing really amazing things. Just speaking for myself, my own daughter graduated from Daddy Stevens just a few years ago. At 25 now, she came out of our mechanical engineering technology program. She works as a design engineer for a local company right here in Lancaster County. And at 25, she's making $80,000 a year. That's incredible. And she also came from a two-year school right here at Daddy Stevens College. So I want you to seriously consider what you want to do moving forward and what that education is actually going to cost you. So think about that too as you're making your decisions about where you want to go. Our next speaker is Christine Ferreira. Anybody ever heard of Christine on the weather? Ever watch the weather on WGAL? Excellent. All right, Christine Ferreira is a meteorologist with WGAL TV. She also graduated from Millersville University right here in Lancaster County. She earned her Bachelor of Science. I remember her telling us a story one year, it might have even been a couple years ago, uh, of her challenges with calculus. And I found that to be really inspiring because so many of our students get scared of math. Uh, so her story about that I think was pretty inspiring. I thank you for sharing that with us. So Christina's going to be actually talking with you about her story and why she chose to pursue a STEM field. Meteorology is a STEM field. So she's going to talk with you a little bit about that, and then for the rest of the program, Christine will be your MC and will be able to introduce some of the other speakers, follow up with some questions and answers at the end. But we're so excited to have you with us. Enjoy the rest of your morning. because of the snow. Did anyone get a snow day yesterday? One. Did you get a two-hour delay? Yeah. All right, all right. Well, I guess it was worth it, right? If it didn't snow, I'd be in big trouble. <laughs> well, my name is Christine, as you heard, and I am a meteorologist. I speak to a lot of young students about the weather, and I say, what do you think a meteorologist means? And they're like, hmm, someone who studies meteors? Well, that's partially true, because a hydro meteor is a raindrop, right? And someone who studies meteorology studies rain and, and weather. So it makes sense. Meteorologists study weather, forecast the weather, predict the weather. Well, I was your age, and my parents kept asking me, what do you want to be when you grow up? How many parents asked that question? Repeatedly. <laughs> I really didn't know. And that's okay if you don't know right now. That's what today is all about, discovering, make a spark or an interest in science or the STEM fields today. That's what we're here for. That's what we welcome you here for today. So I was watching the weather on TV, and I saw all men. I never saw a female or a woman meteorologist on TV when I was growing up. I knew I wanted to be interested in meteorology. I knew I wanted to forecast the weather, but I was almost embarrassed to tell my parents I want to be a meteorologist because I thought that job was for men. So come nowadays, you see more and more women on TV, more and more women in the science fields and meteorology. So that might be something that you aspire to, especially with all these snowstorms that we have. There was one snowstorm when I was growing up, and this really locked in my decision to become a meteorologist. I know you won't remember it, but maybe your teachers will. Superstorm of 1993. Head's nodding, yes. <laughs> that was called the superstorm before everything is called a superstorm, right? Well, this storm brought over 20 inches of snow to a huge portion of the United States in mid-March. And the meteorologist on TV said, hey, the snowstorm is coming, you better get prepared, it's gonna be a big one. To get 20 inches of snow in mid-March is kind of a big deal. And I was watching them on TV, they were on continuous coverage, and I just said, that's it. I want to be the person that predicts the weather, that tells people how to dress, that tells people that one danger is coming. So I decided to study meteorology. I was good at science, but I was bad at math. You guys like math? No? Meteorology is basically the physics of the atmosphere, right? We talk about thermodynamics and the chemistry of the atmosphere and all this science stuff that requires calculus. So I go into college, first year, I take Calculus 1. I got a D minus. 
A D minus. Just give me an F, right? <laughs> D minus, that's kind of insulting. So I had to take it again. I took it in summer school, which was a bad idea because instead of four months of school, of that class, it was crammed into six weeks, five days a week, four hours a day. Got another D. Not the minus, but I got the D. So at this time, my parents started saying, hey, this is not good. Are you sure you want to do meteorology? Are you sure you can do this math and science? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'm gonna get it next time. So I studied so hard. Uh, this is my third time in calculus one, okay? I went to office hours. I annoyed my professors. They were like, oh, it's her again. <laughs> but I passed. I got a B. I was so happy. Thank you. <laughs> then comes calculus two. <laughs> I got a D. I had to take it again. I got a B plus. <laughs> and by the time I got to calculus three, I got an A. First time. So that's my story to do of perseverance, even if you're not good at math and science, but you desire a career in the math and sciences, don't let something little like a math class or 10 math classes throw you off, okay? Never once did I think, oh, I'm not gonna change my major, I'm no good, I have to drop out, I have to consider a different career. Other people thought that. My friends thought that, my professors thought that, even my family thought that. But never once did I think that. So as long as you know what you want, don't let anything stand in your way, right? That's the lesson here. So even though I'm still not good at math, I think I'm an okay meteorologist, right? Did I get the forecast right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so at this time, thank you so much for listening to my story. I want to introduce you to someone here at Thaddeus Stevens. Rebecca Trout is her name. She's a second year student and she's an engineering major. She's going to share her STEM story. Please welcome Rebecca, everybody. Good morning, everybody. How is everybody doing today? Good. I'm sure you've all heard of the phrase, think outside the box. It's a common phrase that is meant to encourage an individual to think differently and from a new perspective. This type of thinking opens up so many opportunities, but I want you to try this. Don't think outside the box. Think like there is no box. Imagine the opportunities that you can encounter then. My name is Rebecca Trout, and I'm a sophomore student in the Mechanical Engineering Technology Program here at Daddy Stevens College. For anyone who is unsure what an engineer does, mechanical engineers use science, math, and technology to design, develop, test, manufacture mechanical devices such as engines, tools, and machinery. Engineers use <coughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Engineers analyze data and make calculations in order to produce the most effective design for a product. We do a lot of math. <laughs> My interest in engineer engineering started when I was young. I was always fascinated with how things worked. I got my first dirt bike when I was eight years old. I loved when my dad taught me about how the choke worked and how to shift gears. I knew that one day I wanted to be the person designing this engineering mechanisms. <laughs> when I was 14, I loved duct tape. I was always using my creativity to make something. I made a draw swing duct tape bag, which you can see up there, and also a pair of shorts that I made just to fit me. In elementary school, I loved math. I was always looking for extra practice sheets and other ways to improve my math skills. In fifth grade, I was asked to go to a Challenge 24 math competition. It's a math card game. In middle school, I was able to learn more hands-on activities in my tech ed classes. So I'd like to know how many people are currently in a tech ed class or a shop class. That's awesome. It's actually more than I thought would be. So fortunately, as a student in the Salanco School District, I was required to take a technical edu education class. This was my favorite class in middle school. In this class, we learned basic woodworking skills, and we also made little cars and raced them on a track in the hallway. This class was great, a great way for students to explore different activities and to possibly discover future career ideas. My eighth grade year, I was assigned with the task of writing an essay and then doing a presentation about what I wanted to be when I got older. And most of you guys may not know what you want to do in eighth grade, but I actually did. Sure enough, I wrote my paper about becoming a mechanical engineer. With that in mind, during high school, I had to pick an elective class. During my senior year, I had an opening in my schedule and I wanted to take a wood shop class because I enjoyed it so much in middle school. 
I went to my guidance counselor and she said that there was no openings for that class, but that I could take a metal shop class. Although I was a little nervous because I had no experience working with metal, I had my guidance counselor sign me up for the class anyway. I knew that it was not a typical class for a girl to be in. I was worried about how, the class, how I would be treated in the class. My first day of class, I walked in and just as I suspected, I was the only girl there. <laughs> um, I only knew a few of the boys in my class and they, knew they had prior experience working with metal. The first month of class made me very anxious. Would the boys make fun of me because I didn't know what I was doing? Would they not treat me the same because I was female? I knew I, had, I knew I could handle it though because I was tough and I knew that if I wanted to be an engineer, which is a male dominated career, that I may encounter discrimination for being a female at least once in my career. Fast forward a few months, I have to tell you that was the best experience I had ever had in high school. I developed a new hobby of working with sheet metal. I had made a small lock box and also a toolbox. All the boys in my class were extremely helpful. In fact, most of them thought it was really cool that I shared the same hobbies as them. My classmates who were experienced in metalworking always encouraged me to ask them questions if I needed help. During the welding unit, one of the student welders in my class actually let me use his auto darkening helmet and that helped me <coughs> learn how to weld easier. My, my teacher was ecstatic to have a girl in his class. I see him, I see him around selling his school district at the ice cream shops and he's always like, hey, Becca Trout, Becca Trout, and he just loves me. So <laughs> although my classmates at the time wouldn't want to hear this, I was definitely one of his favorite students. <laughs> the point is, never be afraid to try something new and outside your comfort zone. If I had never left my comfort zone, I would have never had this incredible experience. You never know what you will learn from trying something new. During this experience, I learned a lot of valuable skills that have helped me here at Daddy Stevens, as well as the skills I needed to pick, fix my Chevy SN pickup. This is my most recent project that I bought, and I have been restoring it with the help of my dad. I have learned a lot from my dad teaching me about how to fix cars, and because of my S10, I would like to continue my education and become an automotive engineer. My experience at Daddy Stevens has been nothing but a positive one. Being, in one. being one of about 100 girls at the school can sometimes be intimidating, but it has made me such a strong young woman. Because of my education at Daddy Stevens, I have been offered multiple job opportunities. Being a woman in a STEM field has actually given me an advantage. Employers are looking to fill their open positions with females, and it has made it very easy for me to find a job. I was actually given an internship last summer during my freshman year, and I had a couple interviews for another internship this coming summer. <laughs> Studying the STEM field was definitely not easy, though. It required a lot of hard work and dedication in order to be successful. Walter Chrysler once said, the real secret of success is enthusiasm. I couldn't agree more with this statement. Pursue a career that makes you excited about what each day is going to bring. The only way a goal or a dream of yours will come true is by working hard at it. Hard work and determination will lead to success. Like my dad always tells me, you can do whatever you put your mind to. Don't let any stereotype or anybody else tell you otherwise. Be that female welder, machinist, engineer, computer programmer, mathematician, or, me or mechanic. Embrace who you are and embrace what you like to do. The opportunities are endless and you just need to go out and find them. If anybody has any questions for me, I will be around after the presentation and I would love to answer them for you. Thank you. job here and please ask her questions. It's great to get someone to talk to one-on-one -on -one if you're considering uh, something like her field or, or you're kind of like her. If you relate to her, ask her questions about why she chose what she did and her path and her career goals and even her internships. I'm, I'm interested to know about these internships. All right, now with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Paige Caslin. She is super cool. I talked to her for five seconds. I already love her. She's super energetic. Did you guys hear last year about a solar airplane that went around the globe? We had it on our news. Do you remember? Can you imagine working on a team, okay, that flies an airplane without a motor around the globe? She was the youngest person on this team, the only American, and one of two females. She's here to share her story. Please welcome Paige Castle. to be here in 
to share my story about how my passion for creativity and problem solving helped me to reach new heights in my career. So as Christine said, my name is Paige Castleman, and I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Who here has visited Pittsburgh? There we go. I love the city of Pittsburgh, and I only left for four years to get my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering at Virginia Tech. I graduated with my degree in 2015, and then after that, started working for a material science company in Pittsburgh. Now, I hope you guys don't think I'm too far removed, but I really feel like it was just yesterday I was in your shoes. I used to love to jump at the chance to go to lectures or go to events at different universities. I wanted to make sure I was being as proactive as possible ensuring I was exposed to all the different potentials around me for what I could do for my career. So let's give you guys an applause because you're here on a Tuesday morning and ready for lunch. So I do want to set the stage for today to just let you know, I'm going to tell you a couple different things about my career, but that's not really the purpose. I don't want to be here and just telling you what I've done. I'm here to show you what you can do if you follow your passion and, I don't know, experiment a little bit with your career. So with that, here we go. All right. I want to tell you five things that I never thought I would do when I graduated with my degree in electrical engineering. Number one, I never thought I would be asked to ride an electric bicycle <coughs> down an airport runway at 30 miles an hour, chasing the solar-powered airplanes that make it. Does anyone in this audience think that they might do that? No, that is ridiculous. Number two, I never thought I would be in Hawaii or airports around the world with a bunch of Swiss people eating Swiss fondue and blasting yodeling music. <laughs> Number three, I never thought I would meet the Prince of Monaco Four, I never thought my career would take me to places like Egypt, where I would have the opportunity to ride a camel around the pyramids. And then finally, number five, I never thought anybody would really be interested in my career as a woman in STEM, and I would have the opportunity to share my story in different magazines, and especially to people like you, the next generation of innovators. Now with that, I started off with all of those different jazzy things about my career, but I have to start back right when I was in your shoes, when I was a middle school and high school student. I said I grew up in Pittsburgh, and I love to be creative. I love to use that creativity to solve different problems. So just even the most simple form of that, um, if my family would receive some furniture, if it was a chair, if it was a bookcase, if it was a desk, I would always offer to assemble everything. I know that seems so basic, but I used to throw away the directions too, so my parents totally thought I was crazy. But I loved to find out how all the different pieces would click together. And once I did that and I had a chair or another piece of furniture, I felt so powerful. Now I know this is really weird that I'm just talking about feeling powerful being able to build this chair, but it was something where you had that gratification, you were able to problem solve and find out how all the pieces click together. Another example was I would always take my high school projects to the next level. I would, I remember one time in a physics course, I was asked to build just a plain circuit with a light bulb. And, you know, I thought that that was kind of boring, just the circuit wasn't anything crazy. So, for whatever reason, at 17 years old, I felt the need to also build a full popsicle stick replica of my science classroom, equipped with tiny little desks, made with uh, paper clips that my fingers still probably hurt a bit today from bending all of those, just so I could then put the light bulb on the ceiling. Like, why on earth did I waste hours of my life doing this? It's kind of ridiculous. But to me, it didn't feel like a waste. Those hours went by so quickly, and then I thought, huh, Maybe something like this is my passion. Building something and creating something and taking something to the next level. That might be my passion. So I wanted to further understand if this is something that 
I wanted to do with my career. I attended, just as I was saying, different lectures or events at universities. One was at Virginia Tech, the university I decided to attend for four years. And I remember there was, um, it was for women in engineering. It was two weeks long, we stayed at the dorms. And for the electrical engineering seminar, we built a radio. Now, we have this pipe. We had to wrap wire around the pipe, connect all these other different components. And when we hit play, and I heard sound, I felt like the smartest person in the world. You know, I'm saying building furniture, I felt so powerful. But this was something completely different. I thought, okay, I turned on my light switch every day, or I use my computer, but I'm not smart enough to be able to figure out how to actually build those things. And then here I was, and it was just happening right in front of me, and, you know, it, it worked. That made me feel like, wow, the potential I thought I could achieve in life were just shattered. I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to be an electrical engineer. So I attended Virginia Tech, and throughout the time, I did a bunch of different things. So even growing up in high school and middle school, I played on the basketball team. I did that year round. I also played softball. I took different courses in high school, like wood shop, AutoCAD, applied engineering. All of these different things that were right in front of me that I would see my friends not taking. I was sometimes one of seven people in the class. I jumped at those chances because, again, I wanted to learn if this was maybe my passion. So at Virginia Tech, I wanted to do the same thing. I joined an engineering professional society, a social sorority, and I even joined a design team where we sent a high altitude balloon 100,000 feet in the air. 100,000 feet, which didn't, probably doesn't mean a lot to people, but 100,000 feet is the point where you can see the curvature of the Earth. We had a camera on board, so we got these amazing pictures where we can see all of the different like things that are on Earth from that high up. There I was, I told you 17, I was building this popsicle stick thing. And then at 19, I was sending a balloon up so high that I could see the curvature of the Earth. Again, the boundary of what I thought I could complete was shattered again. After school, I graduated, or yeah, after college, when I was graduating, I thought, okay, cool. Did all this fun stuff, but now it's time to just follow a normal career path. And that definitely didn't happen. I started working for a material science company called Covestro, and then I attended a professional conference for women in engineering. I walked into this networking event, and I still remember it to this day, walked into this networking event, and I saw a woman with a solar panel on her back. Now I thought, okay, as trendy solar panel guard to wear on your clothes these days, that probably has some use. It probably stores the sun's energy, to power something like your cell phone. I immediately ran over to this woman and asked her where I could find her electronics. How did she build this? Where did she get the tutorial? She told me everything. I returned home from the conference, ordered the parts, and a few days later I had everything to build my very own solar panel phone charging purse. <coughs> this is my cute little purse. I brought it with me today. You know, this works, it's stylish. Well, so anyways, like any engineer, right, the next step is naturally to go get the perfect Instagram shot with my purse. So I made my younger sister take me down to downtown Pittsburgh where I wore high heels and a nice professional black dress, did a bunch of action posing shots with this purse. If my sister thinks I'm crazy, but I got the perfect shot. I was like, thank God, yes, problem solved. And so, I posted it on my Instagram and immediately started receiving comments of people asking where they could buy this purse. Now, I thought this was interesting. When I saw the woman with the solar panel on her bag, I thought, how can I build that? I never once thought, oh, where can I buy something like that? This is where I realized this passion I had for creativity and problem solving actually, you know, is a different mindset than maybe some other people have. But, you know, didn't know what to do, so I was sporting my purse around for the next couple months, because, of course, it goes with any outfit, right? And six months into my first job, six months into my career, 
and I received a life-changing email. The company I was working for, they had a, um, they were partnering with a project called Solar Impulse 2. And that was the world's first solar-powered airplane attempting to circumnavigate the globe. Okay, so let me reiterate this. They were looking for an electrical engineer to travel with the world's first solar-powered airplane that was attempting to fly around the world. A dream job for anybody that's studying engineering that has a passion for creativity and problem solving. So I immediately, I mean, left the office. It was probably like 1, 1 p.m. Left the office, called my mom, and just, like, just, you know, kind of up in the air. I thought, this potential I never realized could even happen is right now in front of me. So, my company was looking for someone with a degree in electrical engineering, a background in public relations, and some bonus points if you had experience with the French language. You know, the normal combination when you're thinking of someone in STEM. And I'm joking when I say that because they're all kind of unrelated. And to explain the story, I want to take you guys back to a young page my freshman year at Virginia Tech. So like I said, I wanted to get involved in all these different activities. I was a part of this group called I Trim Elite, which is my electrical engineering professional association. Tried out to sorority. I gave tours to prospective students at the Virginia Tech Electrical and Computer Engineering Department every Friday. Um, I did my balloon, and I also found time to join the Virginia Tech Scuba Diving Club. I've been a diver for 10 years, but that's a completely different passion. But none of us here are one-dimensional, so I wanted to make sure I was channeling all of those different things that made me me. And I remember I was loving life. Everything was great until one day I went to the library and I was working on a group project. This one guy in my class said, you know what Paige, when our classes get harder next year, you're not going to be able to do all of those different things. Immediately, it was like avalanches coming at me from all angles, and I'm being 100% dramatic right now, but at the time I was really panicking. I thought, what? You can't? Why can't I? And I had heard this before from other people. They kept saying, you can't, you can't, you can't. And this was frustrating me. I didn't want to just be an engineer. I wanted to be a high heel, balloon flying, scuba diving, electrical engineer. What's so wrong with that? And the answer is nothing. Nothing's wrong with that. And what I realized is, why was I listening to, yeah, why was I listening to I know myself in my capacity much better than anyone else. So why was I listening to people telling me I can't? Instead, I decided to find people that told me I could. I found that in my electrical and computer engineering department staff, my IEEE officer team, my sorority friends, my family, all of these other people. I just decided, you know what, if you're going to tell me you can't, I'm going to go find someone who tells me I can't. And it worked. I ended up being the president of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, vice president of public relations for my sorority Tri-Delta, and I found some time to take business French courses to supplement the seven years of middle school and high school French I took growing up. So all of those things made me who I was, and they also made me perfectly qualified for solar impulse. Remember, electrical engineer, check. Public relations, check. Experience with French language, check. I got this, right? The final step was I had to write a 300 word essay explaining why I should be chosen for the project. So guess what I wrote about? I wrote about my purse. And it took me a couple iterations. I first started, this was for the North American leadership team of my company. It took a couple iter iterations I started just writing my resume. I thought, okay, I have to be professional. What does professional look like? And I thought, I'll just list everything in, in word form, paragraph form for my resume. And I would have some people read it and they would say, okay, I mean, this is okay, but nothing spectacular. So I decided to just, you know, two days before the essay was due, throw all of that away and 
great the story of building my solar panel phone charging purse and talking about posting on Instagram and seeing people comment, where can I buy one? And about how I thought, how can I build that? And that was the whole spirit of the project of Solar Impulse itself. And that story got me selected to be on the ground crew for the team. I still remember the North American president of my company telling me, Paige, that was the, kind of the weirdest essay that we read compared to all of the other applicants. We have tons of qualified applicants, but you know, you could see the passion you had for the solar panel phone charging purse and passion you had for building and creating, and you were the logical choice. So I want to pause right here and just reiterate some points. Based on my experiences, I would recommend that you don't do something solely because it's just gonna build your resume. I never thought taking business French or vice president of public relations for my sorority was going to help me get a dream job, but it did. Don't take classes just because it's an EPA or just because that's what all your friends are doing. Because once you get into your career, you don't have all of these different potentials around you to constantly work. Like I told you, I took wood shop and I took AutoCAD growing up, and if I wouldn't have taken that, I don't know what I would have been. I might have not been prepared for a job like this. So, now, I was selected for Solar Impulse, and I was traveling with the team for the second half of the assignment from Hawaii to the United Arab Emirates. And I thought the hard part was getting the job, but I quickly realized I was wrong. When I arrived with the project, um, I arrived in Hawaii and I got into a car and everyone was speaking in Swiss French or Swiss German. And I quickly realized that my vocabulary of I brush my teeth and I go to the shopping center was not gonna cut it when people were asking me, hey, can you pass me the wrench because I have to fix the tire of the solar powered air pump. Yeah, really different, right? So I, um, I want to quickly showcase a video that shows what this project's about. I mean, there's lots of different technical aspects of the project, so this is a nice two-minute video showcasing everything. And if you look for Solar Impulse online, you can find a lot of really exciting, really intense videos, but I wanted to share this one because it's the most technical. in my head. 
but I wasn't ready for what came next. All of a sudden, the team started running around and writing on whiteboards and erasing and writing on paper and then ripping it up and throwing it away. I was thinking, what the heck is going on? Are we supposed to just move these desks around this room? So I was confused. And I was passively standing kind of on the sidelines because I didn't understand what was going on because of the language barrier. And I also, again, didn't understand the complexity of the situation. So about an hour of this happened. And I, and then we had an idea where we were just gonna put two desks in one corner, two desks in another, two here, two there, three down the middle. Not rocket science, right? So I was so confused, I was thinking, what the heck is how, what am I missing? And then I realized different cultures have certain ways that everybody's kind of taught to problem solve. I feel like my experience in America has been, especially for a really low risk situation, my experience has been, okay, you try, you fail, you try, you fail. If something doesn't work, maybe after two weeks, you move it around again. So, you know, my first thought would have been, let's just move these desks and see how they work. But I learned with a Swiss culture, it's much more customary to plan everything out from the start. Figure out all of the different points of failure you know, erase them, rip up the paper, and then until you arrive on a design that is foolproof. But either way, it is better or worse. It was just different. And so now when I work on different teams that are especially diverse or multicultural, I slow down a bit. I remember my experience. I'm not someone that likes to stand on the sidelines, but I remember from my experience, I was so passively sitting, like, you know, just in the background because I didn't know how I could contribute. I talked about capacity earlier. I think at that moment, I was only operating at about 30% of my capacity. I couldn't understand things. I couldn't offer my solutions. I was basically just there. And that was hard for me. So now I like to slow down and make sure everyone's opinion is heard when we're on a group because just because they don't, somebody in the group's not saying something or they're not, really involved doesn't mean that they don't have good ideas. They might just need a moment to catch up. And then the second thing is when you're working on multicultural teams or diverse teams, it's important to get to know each other before you start something. Because, you know, if I would have started just moving the desks, I probably would have given the entire team a heart attack. But they were kind of stressing me out by not letting me just move the desk. They were wanted to plan, plan, plan. And so we weren't fighting as people. Our natural instincts of how we problem solve were just clashing. And I think that happens on many teams, you know? Even sometimes people have different strengths. And some of those strengths will clash with their team. But it's not the person, it's just the strengths. So moving forward on the technical side, this is what I saw when I first walked into the hangar. I saw this huge structure. The wings are 236 feet, like a, like two basketball courts side by side. So imagine this entire basketball court and doubling it, and that's the size of the wings of the airplane. Then you had this helicopter cockpit looking thing that was held up by two wheels, one in the front and one in the back. That was solar impulse. I remember walking into this hangar and thinking, oh my gosh, like, I hope I don't blink too hard and make this whole thing come crashing to the ground. I was terrified of this airplane. That wasn't really gonna work because I was in charge of the handling of the airplane. I was in charge of the different electrical engineering components of the airplane. So I had to figure out how to get that confidence to actually go near it. And when I say handling the airplane, here's a nice video that showcases ten, how it takes 10 people to get this airplane in and out of the hangar. It's huge, right? Yeah. Okay, so I said 10 people. We had our friend crew, and I was one of the members. And every time before we had a flight, we got this paper. And it would say what our position was gonna be for that day. I could be asked to pull this 5,100 pound airplane 
I can be asked to hold the weight. So again, imagine the basketball court, me standing there using this handling mask, me standing there, holding it up, and it wasn't necessarily to hold it up, um, hold up the weight of the plane, but like I said, with tandem wheels like bicycles, when the plane wasn't moving and a gust of wind came, it had the risk of falling from side to side. So we always had to have someone holding onto the weight. And then these are the solar cells from the top. So again, imagine me as a 22 year old thinking, okay, I have to hold onto this weight because if it doesn't, if I let it go, it could fall, crash onto the ground, and then the thousands of solar cells would be damaged, potentially ruining a 12 year project. Not something that I wanted to happen. That's not the headline I wanted you to read. So, another point of holding on to the weight was during takeoffs and landings, I was always standing on the airport runway. This was extremely weird. I still remember the day, whatever, it was the second day, so you know we had our big desk assembly the first day. And the second day, we learned about how to catch the wing of the solar-powered airplane in the landing. I thought, what the heck? How am I supposed to do that? But there are no textbooks for even solar-powered airplanes, so definitely no manual of how to catch the wing. I was told in broken English that as the plane came towards me, I was supposed to you know, loosen up a bit, then start sprinting, avoid the propellers, grab onto the wing, and make sure I didn't crash on the ground. I thought, are you kidding me? How am I supposed to do that? How, and I didn't even know how I could try the confidence inside of myself like, to do this, but again, I guess I just thought, okay, this is a dream job. This is my passion. I better find out some way to do this, and this is my job. <coughs> and then, this is a video of the airplane taking off. So, you know, you see the array of lights, and it looks pretty small, but you can see as it comes over me how large it is. And I also wanted to show this video because this is a massive airplane, but it only makes the sound of the propeller spinning because of the electric engine. So this is my view every time I would sit on the side of the runway and see this huge dragonfly looking structure flying above me. All right, so I could also be asked to wheel the tail out onto the runway. And this is why communication was very important because as I was wheeling the tail, it was only, the wheel was about this big, like eight inches in diameter. And we had it on a little cart, but it was a very fragile part of the airplane. So I had to make sure I was guiding everything. And if we came over a big bump, I had to walkie-talkie everyone to move to the right or move to the left. And then finally, the electric bike. So I said if the airplane was landing, I had to run, avoid the propellers, grab onto the wing. But just in case I couldn't run fast enough, there were electric bikes going 30 miles an hour that could zoom down and be there to hold the weight. Pretty cool, right? <coughs> I remember every single time we received our briefing sheet, I was hoping, hoping, hoping that I would be assigned to ride the electric bike. And one day, it finally happened. I was so excited. I thought, yes, this is my chance. I'm gonna look so cool riding this bicycle. I strapped on my helmet. I had someone explain like what to do, and I thought, yep, I got this. The bike, Everyone knows how to ride a bike, I got this. It was an electric bike. It was pedal assisted, so when I would pedal, the motor would kick on and then propel me to speed to 30, um, 25 to 30 miles an hour. How hard can that be, right? got this. So I remember going out to the runway, waiting about 100 feet behind the airplane, and as the propeller started to spin, I was supposed to make some circles for momentum. So I started in circles. There was another brown crew member there with me, so we made our circles. Then as the plane started to move, we both shot off down the runway. I was so pumped. The wind was in my hair. Everything was great. The warm Hawaiian air was also like in my skin. It was just fabulous. And then I looked over, but no, the other bike was way down the runway. So I started pedaling faster, and I realized my gears were in reverse. So I'm 
still be able to go about 15 miles an hour, and the other bike was 30 miles an hour. Wow, that was embarrassing. I remember getting to the airplane and thinking, ooh, okay, um, sorry everybody, I just got up. And the challenge at this point, though, was I was already a little bit of an outsider on the team. I explained that I was kind of passive because I was operating at 30% capacity because I couldn't talk to anybody and I couldn't help solve problems, so I was kind of just there. And I also struggled a lot translating my personality over the, over the language barrier. I remember one time I used a slang word and this woman turned her head quickly and said, why are you speaking? But, oh God, uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't even know how to answer that. Then I realized she meant to say, what did you just say? She wanted to learn the slang word, but I took it out and I was like, what the heck? You're not allowed to talk. I thought, oh my God, oh good, okay, I'll leave. <laughs> so that's why it was so important for communication when I was on the tail and using, I don't know, more simple words, not being able to use my own little lingo flair that I like to use. And so I struggled. I was just this random person on the side, not able to really make friends. And now, I couldn't ride a bicycle. So, it's a little bit upset, but again, what was I gonna do? And then I was assigned to ride the electric bicycle again. I was like, yes, I'm gonna prove to myself that I can do this. I wanted to ride this electric bicycle, I'm gonna look cool doing it, I'm gonna be able to talk about this forever, in front of groups, it's gonna be great. It was a landing, rather than, or instead of a takeoff. And instead of being behind the airplane, I was supposed to be off to the side. So I knew I had to make my circles, and then as the airplane passed me, I was supposed to go out onto the runway. I thought, I got this. No big deal, I got this. I made sure I checked my gears like 800 times on my way out. I was like, I'm not messing this up again. I turned my bike on and off probably 15 times. And as I was on the side of the runway, the airplane's lights came into my view, got ready, started making my circles, one circle, two circles, my bike turned off. So there, the other bike went three circles, went out onto the runway, there I was, I'm now going like eight miles an hour. I was mortified. I was, uh, I was uh, still like, no, I don't know how this happened. I was dreading getting to the airplane because I just knew that everybody was going to be unhappy with me again. They were already poking fun at my first failure, you know, like friendly. But the second failure, I remember the head of the ground crew coming up to me saying, so what happened this time, Paige? I'm just thinking, oh, why am I so incompetent? How, I'm an electrical engineer, how can I not ride a bicycle? So, I went and kind of talked at the team, and I remember two of my friends telling me, maybe you shouldn't ride the electric bike anymore. I was so mortified. I was embarrassed about myself, but also just like, God, now everybody else is thinking that I can't ride the stupid bike. Then my mom is here today, and she can attest to the fact that I got back to my hotel, or got back to my house in Hawaii, and called her, bawling my eyes out. That all, I was an outsider and I was a failure and I didn't know what to do and I just couldn't do anything. And she definitely thinks I'm crazy all the time, but I just didn't know what to do. I had two choices I could give up, which how do you give up the job of a lifetime? Like, what was I going to do? Call someone to say, hey, I have to not do this because I don't know how to ride a bike. Like, I've definitely failed before, but for whatever reason, this failure was hitting me so hard. I got up the, I gathered up the courage to go to front for briefing the next day. We were, we were debriefing about the flight. We all were in a circle, and people were all pointing out each other, telling everybody what other people did wrong and what went wrong in the mission. Thankfully, nobody, at least in English, was talking about my embarrassing bike failure for the second time. But I realized this isn't a supportive culture. This doesn't empower us to do better. So when it became my turn to speak, I said, all right, well, I want to thank Owen for helping me with the power system's first engine, Rashar for walking me through the 
blueprints for our Google My Drive. And I want to thank Stefan for helping me and teaching me how to ride the electric bicycle. Immediately, the mood changed. Everyone was kind of staring at me like, what? Like, how, what did you just say? I didn't know what to do, so I kind of just motioned to the person next to me, like, okay, your turn. And the first words that came out of my mouth were positive as well. I mean, of course, you have to address the problems with the mission, and you have to make sure that you don't repeat those problems. But there was a different way and a different atmosphere on the team now, a little bit more positive. After the debriefing, I kind of went my way. And Stefan, the guy who helped me with the bike, ran up to me and he said, oh my gosh, Paige, I didn't know that that meant so much to you. Like, thank you so much. No one has ever thanked me publicly before. That meant, that meant a lot. Like, never hesitate to ask me again. It's like, oh my gosh, what? You're thanking me for thanking you? <laughs> but it meant so much to him. Apparently, no one had ever thanked him publicly in a setting like that. At this moment, I realized this could be my role on the team. You can be a leader. You don't have to be a leader by, you know, finding the solution all the time, making a winning shot, or even seamlessly riding an electric bicycle down an airport runway. You can be a leader by expressing kindness and gratitude. You can be a leader by building the supportive system of a team that you want to be a part of, that you want to see. And that's what I did. The team went from Hawaii to California, Arizona, Oklahoma, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Spain, Egypt, and then the United Arab Emirates. For a long time, I felt like an outsider on the team that was kind of just over in the corner, unable to speak to anybody, do anything. But when I was standing on that airport runway in Abu Dhabi in the UAE, seeing that airplane come towards me, looking left and right to my fellow ground crew members, I never felt more at home. So with that, I just want to leave you with three messages. Number one, passion. Use passion to guide your choices. I told you about how whenever I was at Virginia Tech, I didn't necessarily think, okay, do an engineering with a background in PR, some French, all of those different things. I never thought that those things would help me in my career. But I was passionate about them. So I used that passion to guide my choices. Find the third. Second, diversity. And I'm talking about diversity in two different ways. So experiences out of your comfort zone will help you grow. You're going to work on teams your entire life, especially in STEM fields. And having diverse experiences, just like I did, being on a multicultural team, being asked to do a bunch of weird things that were way out of my comfort zone, I feel like I grew so much from that experience. I talked about a couple of the struggles I had with solar impulse, but there were amazing things that happened too. I'm glad that I had those struggles though, because when you fail, that's when you learn. When you're on diverse teams in the future, slow down, like I mentioned, just like me, unable to really understand what was going on, and so the tables. Slow down, make sure all the voices are heard, Get to know your teammates and get to know their unique individual experiences, and then you'll be a stronger team. And then finally, support. Support is really the greatest key to success. When I failed riding the bike, it was one of those moments just like at Virginia Tech. When I heard the echoes of, maybe you shouldn't ride that bike again, it was just like whenever I was told, you can't, back in my college days. No one is empowered when you tell them, oh, you can't do that. If people say you can't do that, go find people that tell you that you can. When I was struggling with my bike and thinking my confidence was so low, and it's embarrassing, like, please laugh about my bike story because why was I crying about not being able to ride a bike? And the reason why I was crying because my confidence was low. I didn't have a support system. I needed someone in that moment to say, you got this. So even if it's not somebody directly with someone on your team, like I called my mom, I called my family, I called my friends, support's so important. And I want to ask you guys a question. So 
think, try to remember right now a time when we gave just a compliment to somebody else and not talk about, hey, do you think she's trying to tell you all talk that this yellow jacket is super cute? But a compliment like, you know, Christine, you're sorry about your calculus experience and trying over and over and over because you knew it was your passion, that's so important. And Becca, your story about growing up and taking all of these different classes and getting out of your comfort zone, you have so much courage, that's amazing. Compliments like that, compliments where you're talking about the character of a person, it makes them feel good. It's so important to make sure that you're spreading your appreciation for others because it makes them feel amazing and it costs them nothing. So try to remember that. I try to give somebody a compliment every single day that's about their work ethic or their personality or something. All right, so the solar impulse team flew around the world without a drop of fuel. And that really shattered a lot of the boundaries of what I think I could do with my life. You know, growing up, I remember thinking, like I said, when I was 17, I thought, oh wow, like wiring up the circuit, that's really cool. And in college, sending the balloon up, I never thought I could do that. I never thought I was gonna do those five things that I started my talk with, but I did. And it makes me frustrated a bit. Why do I think that I can't do something? So, again, I wanna leave you with one more thing. Think now, individually, what you think would be something amazing that you want to do, something that aligns with your passion, but something that you might think is too hard, or you're not smart enough, or there's just no way that you would be lucky enough to get an opportunity like that. Think of something right now and keep that in your mind. And when an opportunity pops up for you to get maybe one step closer, or for you even just to capture that whole opportunity at once, don't be afraid to take it. I want to thank you all today. Again, you're doing awesome things, being here on a Tuesday morning really early, learning about the different things that you can be passionate about. So thank you, Thaddeus Women's College, for hosting me today and letting me share my experience. I'm here and I want to take that message further. And hopefully, you feel if you ever need a supportive system, you can reach out to me. I have a Twitter, Instagram, anything. You can direct message me. I'll be here to say you got this because you all have the power to take it further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paige. Thank you. That was amazing. Very inspiring. Thank you. We're going to field some questions. We only have 10 minutes. So if you have a question, you can put your hand up. Rebecca will cover that side. I'll cover this side. Who's got the first question for Paige?
What was your What was your favorite thing that you built in um, tech ed class in high school or middle school? Or like the welding class? Um, I think my favorite thing was the toolbox I made. I didn't get a picture of that on my thing, but um, that was in high school. But in middle school, we made, I had the wood shelf I had up there. That was actually the first like woodworking thing where we got to use like the flame and like actually design the outside, which was pretty cool. And I had never done that before, so that was definitely an experience that I know a lot of middle school girls don't get to have, but Salanco School District had that in our curriculum to take that, so I was really fortunate in that sense. Did you ever get to like ride the airplane? Yeah, that's a good question. So I never um, was able to ride any airplanes because it's only into one seater. There were two pilots that would, would alternate. So when the plane is up, one pilot would be in it. And the, when the plane is on the ground, they would switch and the other one would go up. An interesting story, and I was talking about this a bit before the talk, was this plane only goes 30 miles an hour. So when the plane was crossing the Pacific Ocean, it took five and a half days for one person. And you know, five and a half days, one person, not really autopilot, you have to find a way to sleep. So the pilot would sleep every two hours for 20 minutes using self-hypnosis and meditation. And that's how this guy sustained in this airplane for five and a half days, which is pretty crazy. So I'm glad I was kind of just only asked to running around the way because I don't know if I would be able to do that. I cannot, I can't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> Next question on that side. Yeah. Who is your inspiration? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I really think that, I heard this one speaker once, um, Rosanna St. John, and she used to be the Chief Brand Officer of Uber. She was involved with Apple Music and Pepsi and now works for a company called Endeavor. And I remember seeing her speak and she walked up on stage with a pink, or pink, a pink sparkly skirt, high heels, and just worked it. She was just like, this is me, this is what I am. And she's this top executive. I think she's really one of my inspirations because Seeing somebody be themselves, and I talked about that a lot in my talk, none of us are one-dimensional. Following just this basic path, I'm never going to be a global electrical engineer. It really doesn't exist. Following, seeing her be able to follow her passion and be 100% herself shows me that, yep, that is the way to be successful. So, thanks for the question. I have two questions. Quick ones for Rebecca. We have Solanco students here, and they wanted to know if you were from Smith or Swift. Swift. I didn't know. Swift. Claremont and then Swift. Okay, thank you. Paige, you have a question for you. I'm wondering if you were able to talk about what your newest project is, and um, just if you could elaborate on what you're working on now, because I imagine the following this is kind of, I don't know. It's, yeah, it is kind of challenging. So many people, once I finish this project, said, there's no way you're gonna have a cooler job than that. That kind of freaked me out when I was 23 years old. And thinking that, okay, have I peaked in my career? So I'm from Pittsburgh, and when I returned back after the project, um, that was right whenever the self-driving car industry started picking up in Pittsburgh. And so since then, I've been involved with building relationships and partnerships between um, material science companies, the one that I work for, and car manufacturers and ride sharing companies. And my plan right now, um, I'm ready I think for a change a bit, and I was thinking a natural idea might be going back to get my MBA. My mom got her MBA, I had lots of friends that got an MBA. But then I stopped and I thought, okay, what am I passionate about? I'm obsessed with everything going on with self-driving cars. Is the MBA the best fit for me right now? I explored some different programs, and there's a program at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh that's all about information systems and artificial intelligence and robotics. And so that's what I'm planning to do starting in May. And exciting to see what are the next five things that I never thought I would do. Okay, my question is for you, Rebecca. What, who is your inspiration? 
say my inspiration is my dad. I talked about him a couple times in my presentation, but he actually does like maintenance work, so he does facility maintenance at AJA Pile, and he's pretty much taught me like everything I know. So he does more of the hands-on aspect, but since I had the brain, I decided to go into engineering and do the design work behind it. So definitely my dad. Um, this question is just a general one, but it, is this college a part of Penn State University in general? So we actually have a 2 plus 2 program with Penn State. So I'm in mechanical engineering and I actually applied to Penn State Harrisburg next year. So um, I got accepted and if I want, all my credits will transfer from my two years here straight to Penn State. So I'll only have to do two more years at Penn State and then I'll have my four year in mechanical engineering. What was the purpose of the mission? Was it an R&D mission, or I'm just curious? Yeah, the purpose, it was, it was partially R&D. And so for a company like the one I work for now, we supplied material to the project. And then after the project and all the extreme tests that the thing went through just flying around the world, we got the data back and we were able to complete our material. But the overarching mission of why this project was even started is to just start challenging the status quo. A lot of people said there's no way that you can fly an airplane day and night around the world only powered by the sun. And then these, the two pilots decided, well, we're gonna find people that say we can. We're gonna stop telling those people, we're gonna stop hanging out with people that say we can't. And they were able to do it. So if we're able to fly a solar powered airplane around the world, it's just a thought. If we're able to fly the solar powered airplane around the world, what else can we be doing with different forms of alternative energy? How long, how long were you in Hawaii? Sorry, this is where the... Oh, okay. Um, so, okay, this is a really great part of it, but I was in Hawaii for three months with the project, which was amazing. I told you guys I got to go to Egypt for my job. I never thought I would be able to spend three months in Hawaii, but how great is that? Um, and throughout that time, it was very interesting because I was still a little bit rocky on how I felt as a student on this team, and it was um, it was an experience that I think going back now it was challenging to work through the language barrier to learn how to catch the wind of the airplane, but it's an experience that I'll never forget. Um, and my friend wanted to know how much you make me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that. STEM fields are awesome because just as we learned earlier today, and they're definitely very lucrative fields, I would say that um, I'm definitely not retiring yet, but I have had the opportunity to do things like build a house and utilize my engineering skills to wire up my own chandelier and I built my own clubhouse table and built my own patio. So I think just having the freedom to now have a space where I can just constantly engineer different things. What was your schedule like? Ooh, the schedule was interesting. So there were some days where I would be working 12-hour shifts at night, holding up a wing of an airplane. There were some days where I was running around Hawaii looking for components for the solar-powered airplane. And it was actually really fun whenever I would go into a Home Depot or Lowe's, you know, the person said, hey, what can we help you with today? can't really explain, well, I just, I need this push to talk button for my solar powered airplane. They're like, what the heck is he talking about? Like, mm, please leave me now. So, it always varied, and I think, as an engineer, you learn a lot about just problem solving in general, and that's really important because whatever problem was thrown at me throughout this project, I felt like I was ready for it. I could use that problem solving mentality I got from college. She says she had an internship this summer, and I was wondering what the internship was about. Like. My internship? Um, so I actually worked in York. I didn't do too much engineering for my first internship, but I worked as like a hydraulic tech. So we worked on hydraulics, so like built power units, wired different machines. Um, so that was really cool because I like the hands-on stuff. I've always been brought up with the hands-on stuff. So I got to do that, and then they actually offered me part-time when I started school again. 
So I started working while going to school here for my sophomore year. And then I finally got to do some engineering, so I worked in the office and did some drawings. And I got to do a little bit of both hands-on and in the office. So I had, an, I had an interview last week, hoping to hear back from that one, so I might have another one lined up for the summer. That's great. Thank you so much, Becca. And thank you to Paige. Let's hear another round of applause for that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris. Student Services. Sorry, that was a little technical glitch. I just want to thank everyone for coming out and who were the speakers. Let's give them all another round of applause. Hopefully, some of you were inspired to think outside of the box and take a chance in the STEM careers. This college is ready to receive you and do whatever we can to make you successful. So we look forward to working with you in the near future. Next year, we will have another STEM speaker. Uh, that announcement will be coming out shortly. So for the educators in the room, look forward to hearing about that in the very near future. We'll also be sending out a survey to all the schools to give us some feedback on today's program and some ideas moving forward. And lastly, uh, to exit the building and get to your buses, they're parked over here, so you want to go back up the steps, down in front of the building, and the buses are parked there. We did give them the heads up that we're wrapping up, so they warmed up the uh, buses for you. It is a little chilly still out there. Thank you again for coming to Stevens. We look forward to seeing you soon.